everybody, my name is Jens Larsen. Joe Pass is one of the most important jazz guitarists when it comes to chord solos and solo guitar. And if you're in any way interested in any kind of mainstream jazz guitar, then you definitely want to check out his amazing work. To give you some insight into his playing, especially when it comes to chord solos and chord melody, I'm going to go over the first part of his recording of Lil Darling of the Intercontinental album, which in my opinion is probably one of his best albums, if not his best album. What I'm going to do is that I'm going to break down what he plays in the beginning of the song, and that's going to give you some insight into how he harmonizes the melody, of course, but I'm especially going to focus on what he plays in between the phrases of the melody. For me, studying Joe Pass, and especially his chord solos, were really a huge part of building my chord vocabulary and also just giving me some really great examples of how you can make melodic statements and harmonize them with chords. I think for those skills alone, he's worth checking out. If you want to learn more about jazz guitar, improve the way that you solo or check out some interesting arpeggios or chord voicings, then subscribe to my channel. If you want to make sure not to miss anything, then click the little bell notification icon next to the subscribe button. The first two bars of the song is really just Joe Pass harmonizing the melody. And he does this with block chords, which means that he's putting a chord under each note on the melody. Now the structure of this song really lends itself well to uh, adding fills because each four bar phrase is really just a two bar melodic phrase and then there's a sustained note and under there you can add a lot of melodic fills. The first two bars sounds like this. So what we have here is really just D7 to G7 and then to C major. So the song is in the key of C major uh, in this recording. And we're starting on the dominant of the dominant, which is D7. And just using this, the A is in the melody and it's just a D9 under it, which you can look at as being, I mean, you can think of this as being an F sharp half diminished voicing, of course. I think really that first bar is just thinking of different variations of, of this chord. So we have this tritone all the time and then just changing the melody. So first the A, then the E, and then the D. Then on the G7, there's a C in the melody, so it's a G7 sus. So that's just an F major triad in this case, so really this sound. Down to the A melody, and that's just the same chord but not uh, playing the high note, the highest note. And back to the C. And then just to take us to the C major 7, adding flat 9 and we get sort of a G7 flat 9 like this and then up to the C major 7. The following two bars are really just fills that Joe Pass is adding on top of the chords and the chord progression is taking us back to the D7 because really we just get the same melodic statement twice. So first we get C major, F7, then E7 and then A7 back to the D7 in the next line and we come out on this melody note then up to the G here, and then we get first just a low G, and then I think an accidental D uh, note that's just an open string. Then he goes to the F7, and I think he's playing it like this, at least it's this voicing that he's playing, and it makes sense that he's playing it like this, because what happens next is we get a fill, but really that fill is just coming out of this voicing, because we add the 13 up here, and then just arpeggiate the top three strings. Then we move down to this E7, I think actually this one, uh, and which is a little bit surprising because it's an E7 with a 9 here, and he's moving that up to the sharp 9, which is a clever way to do that. It's a little bit surprising because you wouldn't expect an E7. Your ear doesn't really expect an E7 with a 9 in, at this point in the song. And then uh, down to the same with a 9, and now it's being used to just take us down to the A7 flat 13. And then two notes which are really just sort of arpeggiating to keep the motion going within the chord melody. And then down to the F sharp on the D7 in the next line. In the second line we get pretty much the same melody as the first time around. And it's harmonized a little bit differently. 
uh, but it's just a variation on the same theme really. So we're coming out on the F sharp and then we get the melody again using this version of the D7 without the root though. And then down to the same voicing without the with another top note. And then moving down to on the D here, he's using a third interval. And then it's really just this movement. And that works really well in this case because you get down to the F major triad. So we have this moving nicely in the scale. And then a slight variation on the, on the melody here, but still just using the F major triad. And then again, the flat nine is introduced. And now the song is going to a C7. So that's really just moving this shape up two frets. And then there's a ghost note that I think was supposed to be a G. Uh, like this. But uh, sounds like that. And then we get a short G7, which is really just first the root, then the tritone, and then to C7. So the fills here are really just adding a melodic fill in between chords here. He's not really using the chord that bar. In the next bar he does use the chord because once we're on the C7 with the tritone here, so that's just basically a rootless version of this, you get this uh, this short fill. And that's really, it's a quite neat way of doing that because he's using first this A13 and then an A13 with a flat 9 and he's probably playing it like this with these, with these fingers and then you can easily add the C up here so that this C so we first get first get the pickup, and then you can change that into a C7 flat nine. So that's sort of a neat idea to do it like that. And I think with this fingering, it's quite playable. One of the main reasons that is possible for me to keep making all these videos is the fact that I have a community of people supporting the channel over on Patreon. And actually, this video is coming out of a request from one of my patrons. So if you want to help me keep making videos, then check out my Patreon page. The next four bars are a little bit more full in the melody because we have two melodic statements that are each a bar long. Uh, and it goes to the fourth degree, so we get this sort of uh, four, four minor, and then back to one. So really basic harmony. It's of course this is an old swing classic, so it's not going to have too many Coltrane changes or things like that. Uh, so we come out on the F six with the uh, with the six in the melody, which is kind of also a, a typical thing for that per period, and which goes away a little bit later, I think. But uh, maybe maybe that's just my interpretation. So we get first the F6 like this, leading note, B flat 7, and then we get resolving down to a C, really a C6, like this. And he, I think he's just playing this fourth interval and then another fourth interval. And then we get a fill that's really just playing one chord but then arpeggiating it. So, and this also kind of ties into, and actually the other fill with, with the F7, like this one actually does tie into what I talked about in the video that I published uh, last Monday on different ways of playing the chords and also really using complete voicings as arpeggios because this is a way of turning them into fills without really doing anything and without having to harmonize a million different notes and just trying to use the voicing and turning that into a melody. And this is such a powerful concept, both when you're playing chord melody and making fills in the way that you're playing themes or in your chord solos, but really also a way of thinking if you're trying to come up with lines and really using your chord voicings as melodic structures as well. Then we get a repeat of that melody, so still back to the F6, leading note, and then the B flat 7, and then he's walking up the scale and ending on this G, but then using a, an E7 sharp 9 here which is actually something I think is, I'm not sure if that's in the original, I didn't really check, uh, but so in the Count Basie version. But what is really typical for Joe Pass is he, he will very often turn the three chord into a dominant chord. I think he really loves to, to have that pull forward all the time. And you will see that if you start checking out his solos that he will also just add that at random 
uh, within songs or even in a blues at the, in the turnarounds and really not come back out on the tonic but come out on on the third degree as a dominant. Here he does this and he plays it with some sort of tremolo. I'm not sure how he does that exactly, probably like this. Um, take and then moving this phrase down to an A7 and here we get really sort of a cliche movement that is really useful to know. Uh, I think somehow I'm mostly connecting it to bossa nova, but really you'll find it everywhere. Everywhere. So here again, the A7 now is an A7 13, which is kind of not what we would expect. We would expect, of course, to have flat 13 in, in the key of C major, but he really uses that because it's parallel. Adding another melody note and then changing the flat thir the 13 into a flat 13, and then down to the D7. So it's a really really a smooth way to go from an A7 that sounds a little bit surprising to the A7 that we expect and then move on in the song. And also something you'll find in a lot of bossa nova stuff. In the next four bars we get the first melodic statement but now it's harmonized differently because in the first two versions of it, we have first the 505 and then we have the 5 chord. Now it's only on the 505 because we're in the middle of the form of the song. He comes out with the same, really the same as the beginning. So just this D7 with the 5th melody, with the ninth, with the root. And then instead of going down to a G7 now, it's going to be a C melody note. But it's on the, on the D7, so he's harmonizing it like this. And then we get this a little bit faster D7 run. This is all harmonized with, with D7 chords. So first there's the, this third interval, then with the seventh, with the root in the melody, and then with the ninth in the melody, going to a D minus seven, and that's this D minus seven. Then we get another fill that's actually also a really good example of how you can work with arpeggiating the voicings, which is really how he's getting away with a lot of the fills that he's playing uh, in general. We kind of take this D minor 7 11 voicing and then you're just harmonizing, uh, I'm sorry, then you're just arpeggiating it. First these two, so the C and the E, and then on the G, here it's a, it's a triplet, so this comes out on the third beat, and here I add the rest of the chord, and I'm turning it into a G7 with a 13, and then, oh sorry, this melody and then he moves up to another E7 sharp 9 which um, I think I've written E7 sharp 9 uh, but he actually adds a low B flat here so you could also think of this as being a B flat 7 and then we get this sort of encircling of the tritone of the A7 which is again actually also something he does more often so that's also something that's very typical for him. Too. And then the last part coming out on the A7 tritone here, adding this melody, and then the last note of that melody, which is a fill here, is just turned into a D7, setting it up for the second half of the theme. If you want some exercises that can help you turn your chord voicings into something that you can play melodies with, then check out this video because there I go over how to do that and demonstrate it on a turnaround in the key of F major. If you want to learn more about jazz guitar and this is the first time you see one of my videos, then subscribe to my channel. These are the kind of videos that I publish every week. And of course, if you want to help me keep making videos, then check out my Patreon page. That's about it for this week. Thank you for watching and until next week.